sound design. Hey, Nathan Lively here. I want to give you a quick idea of what to expect in the next season of Sound Design Live. We've got Alan Breimer, who's going to talk about content marketing. And then I've got Ed Gandia, who's going to talk about networking and referral strategy. Then I've got Nat Corin, who's going to talk about working almost exclusively with the labor union. I've got Heather Lynn Egan, who's going to talk about touring and lighting and stage managing. Then I'm going to talk about podcasting with Craig Hewitt and how to add that as a service to your business. And then I'm going to talk about sound system design for the automotive industry with Shelley Uprichard. I hope I'm saying her name right. I forget it, how to say it a lot. Then I'm going to talk about acoustics for home studio and concert with... Tim Perry, Sat Live, and Sound System Tuning Galore with Thomas Neumann. And then I'll end the season with Ozark Henry talking about a new kind of surround sound called Aura 3D. But before we get to any of that, I have the feeling that this is going to be a very busy, active, productive year for everyone. So the first thing I want to share with you is this interview that I did with Elena Boucher, who is a meditation teacher. But it's a different kind of meditation that you don't necessarily need to do while you are sitting down with your eyes closed. It's the kind of thing you could use to help you build self-confidence for better productivity in any part of your life, any time of the day, anywhere that you are. And I thought that would be a great way to kick off the year, to kick off the season of the Sound Design Life podcast. Oh, and let me warn you that the audio from my side of the recording is kind of messed up. I made a mistake. And there's uh, some annoying echo in there. I tried to do some audio surgery with Isotope RX-5 and remove some of that, but it's still there. Luckily, Elena does most of the talking, so you only have to listen to that weirdness every once in a while. Sound design. Welcome to Sound Design Live. I'm Nathan Lively, and today I'm joined by Elena Foucault in Hong Kong. Elena, did I say that right? <laughs> it's Fouché. Oh, Fouché. Why did I say Foucault? Okay. Fouché. Who's Foucault? That's a, oh, he's a writer. Yes, I am a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> so you are an American with a French name in Hong Kong. Yes. No questions about that. That's fine. <laughs> So we can get to that, but Elena, thanks for being here. So I'm talking to you today because the listeners of Sound Design Live are not only sound engineers that want to master their craft, uh, but they want to enjoy their lives while they're doing it. So I want to talk to you about meditation for busy people, boosting your self-confidence for better productivity, and your coaching practice. But first of all, Elena, what music do you think you'll be listening to when you become enlightened? My favorite band, maybe this is more the the spirit of your question, is Thievery Corporation. I'll probably still like them later <laughs> in heaven or wherever. Do yeah. they still play? They've been around for a while, right? They have. I don't know. I don't follow their modern stuff. I have a lot of recordings of theirs. So I was just thinking the other day, it's time to go look and see. So Elena, I would love to incorporate more stress-reducing habits and strategies into my life, like meditation. But sometimes it feels impossible on busy days when I'm up late the night before at a rehearsal and then I have to be back super early the next day for the event that just happened to me this week, for example. So... I like that you suggest developing a habit of relaxation, not meditation. So it's not like you're trying to add something to my already crowded schedule. You're just asking me to relax while I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the meditation practice that I have now, but I don't want to feel like I'll suffer if I don't have time to sit and meditate one morning. So what are some other ways that people like me can get some of the same results even if we don't have the opportunity to uh, sit down and meditate? Well, one of the things that I like to share with people is that there's lots of different ways to meditate. We have this sort of popularized idea about meditation, um, and there's kind of a classic way to meditate that we all know about, that we see in pictures or, you know, we hear about, which is you sit down cross-legged, you close your eyes, 
you don't move, and you follow your breath and clear your mind, something like that. And that is an awesome way to meditate. It's also fairly difficult for people who are beginners, um, I find. And as you're saying, it requires time to set aside from everything else you're doing. So one of the things that I like to do is teach people, we could think of them as mini meditations, little meditations that you can do while you're in an elevator or in between emails or um, maybe while you're washing your hands or while you're standing in line, things like that. Like little, just little tiny short in time meditations that you can do. So for instance, to If you're having this situation where you're not having time to really sit, you can do a little mini practice anywhere. So especially like you don't have time to sit in the morning, so you could do a mini practice while you're brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. Or you could do it, you know, I don't know if either you drive or you take the bus, you could do it while you're going. You could do it when you get there, things like that. So there's lots... I mean, I like, to, I like to compare meditation lately to sports. You know, there's a lot of different sports you can do, a lot of them. So meditation is the same way. There's a lot of different ways to meditate. And so the, the classic one is one we know the most, but there's a lot of other ones. And so these little mini meditations are a good example of just another way to meditate. Yeah, I guess I, guess I thought that to do meditation you have to give it 100% of your attention. And it sounds like you're saying that that's not necessarily true. I can still get benefits from it. And there's still ways to practice doing it. And I don't know, I could be potentially driving a car or working or anything, right? Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Well, the way I like to define meditation, and of course, also there's, (laughs) like sport, this is why it's such a good analogy, you can define sport in different ways. You know, sport can be um, an activity, like a physical activity. It could be like honing your mind. Um, Sport can also be for stress reduction. So meditation is the same. It can be, you can do it for all different kinds of reasons, all different kinds of ways. So yeah, you you can do meditation that is sort of like sensory deprivation, right? Closing the eyes, being in a quiet room and not moving. And in that sense, what you're doing is directing your your attention to essentially stillness or possibly like just the breath. So this is like one way where you're taking all of your attention and you're focusing it on one thing and you, you don't want anything else to interrupt you. No sound, no noise, no movement, nothing so that you get this kind of one pointed focus. So that's that's kind of how that feels, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're saying it's like 100% everything is right here on the breath. That's it. And that's a really beautiful way to meditate. This other these other ways that I'm talking about um, are a bit more open. We're still directing our attention. So we're still, and this is a big point of meditation, is to learn how to direct the attention or focus the mind on something. So in the example I was just saying, you're focusing your mind, say, just on the breath. These other kinds of meditations, you're still focusing your mind generally on one thing, like you pick something to focus on. And indeed, it could still be the breath. But in this case, you don't have to have everything else gone you can still have, you know, sensory input other than just the thing you're focusing on. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, that, yeah. That, that completely makes sense. And I even, I think about back when I was, or when I've read some guides to meditating that say things like, you know, you should have a special space or a room where you meditate and sure. you might have an altar sure. and all these things. And I never did that. And that always kind of made me feel like, oh, I'm not doing meditation right. Maybe this is why I'm not as good at meditating as I should be. (laughs) (laughs) But I guess you can get as deep into it as you want, because if you, you, like you said, you could go to a sensory sensory deprivation chamber and that would, that would kind of be the ultimate. Sure. Yeah. And again, you know, there's so many different ways to do it. And so, yeah, in the sense that if you want to do it strictly that the way that you were reading about, okay, yeah, you're not doing that kind of meditation correctly because they want you to do it in a certain way. 
But as soon as you start doing other kinds of meditation, I mean, for instance, I don't know if you've ever heard of Osho, but Osho's meditations are crazy. They're like, no, you jump that? up and down. Osho is a, 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 a teacher. He's dead now, but he was, of course, an Indian guy. <laughs> he was actually got popular in America and he came over for a little while in Oregon. But anyway, that I know about him just because of that, because I studied meditation for about six years, like many different kinds. Mm -hmm. And um, being an American, of course, I learned about his stuff as well. And his meditations, you like, you listen to music, you get in a group of people and some of them you do things like jump up and down and make loud noises. And I mean, wow, <laughs> it's, it's really, almost more like ecstatic dance or something. Yes, right. Exactly. So, Okay, let me, how about we do this? Let's back up a little bit and define meditation. And I think that'll help. Yeah, because, because I, we, we kind of dove right in and I didn't, yeah. I didn't really ask those initial questions because there's probably lots of people who are listening who don't practice meditation yet and aren't really sold on um, what it can do for your life. So yeah, I'd love it if you can yeah. define meditation. Sure, and even people like you and me who in the beginning we thought, oh, meditation is this one thing. And it doesn't have, and now I'm saying it doesn't have to be. Well, okay, wait a minute. What's meditation if it's not just this one thing, right? Yeah. So I like to define it, to define it very simply. I like to define to define it as meditation is a way to focus on something. So it's focusing on something, and just like that, and I mean just normal everyday focus. Like we could focus on a television. We could focus on. Uh, a movie, we could focus on our email. But of course, it's a way to focus. It's a certain kind of focus. So what kind of focus makes it meditation? So what's the difference between meditation and looking at a TV or watching a movie? Well, it's this idea of presence. It's this idea of while we're focusing on something, we are also aware of ourselves focusing on it. And that awareness is called presence. And I can, presence is also very simple. Just like focus, we all understand what focus means. We actually, I can talk all of us into focus right now by just saying, okay, notice where you are. Notice that you are wherever you are. So for instance, I'm sitting down. So it's just to notice myself sitting here in this room and now I'm present. So you can be present in an instant by me just saying, okay, notice wherever you're sitting, whatever room you're in or wherever you're standing, maybe you're on a bus or whatever you're doing, just notice that you're there right now. Here you are. So now you're present. So it's just these simple, two simple ideas. It's focusing on something and being aware that you're doing it, being present. So for instance, if I say to you, okay, really notice or focus on this podcast that you're listening to my voice right now and notice wherever you are. So become present. As soon as you do those two things together, we can say you're meditating. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. So, so maybe the opposite would be if I'm kind of, I'm not aware of where I am and I'm kind of lost in an activity, forgetting mm that not not paying attention that I'm actually doing it. Does, does that make sense? I don't know. That yes, seems a little absolutely. Confusing. No, it makes total sense. You're exactly describing what we do 99% uh, of the time. That happens to me at work a lot. <laughs> or you know what? That happens to me when as soon as I start looking at a screen, I feel like yes. a lot of times then I kind of get sucked into there and then I get that feeling. Sometimes I'll look up and be like, oh, where am I? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> or where did all that time go? Or yeah, yeah. Exactly. So the, the, dip, the opposite of being present, for instance, or we could say maybe the opposite of meditating, but specifically the opposite of being present. So the opposite of noticing where we are and being aware of where we are is being lost in the thought. So just thinking about what has happened and what we thought about it and whether we liked it or not, and who it was with and whether we want to do it again in the future and how to make it happen this mm -hmm. way or that yeah. way. Lots of planning and organizing. And that's a beautiful thing to do. Like we have these amazing minds, you know, and this great capacity for remembering and planning. And we want that. Like we want to learn from our mistakes. We want to build on our successes. That's beautiful. And the thing is, is that we don't balance that enough. Like we don't, we don't come back down into our bodies and notice like 
what's happening right now. So we're like constantly, constantly planning instead of <laughs> planning a little bit and then doing or being present. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And why does that matter? Well, I mean, in a sense, it doesn't at all, except for that. If you if you think about it for a moment, where is your life actually happening? OK, most of us, yes, our life is happening in our thoughts because that's where we spend most of our time. Yeah. But the physical reality of being alive is that your life is happening right now, you know? So all that stuff you're thinking about and planning about, it's actually where where it's going to happen and where you're going to realize those plans is right here and right now. And if, you know, you do all this planning about something you want to happen, and then when it's actually happening, you're thinking, you're lost in thought and not actually noticing what's happening. Well, you know, how nice is that? How, what has this done for you in your life? I know I didn't, we didn't really talk about this yet, but um, I'm just curious, do you feel more present now that you've practiced this a lot? Or do you kind of know and notice in contrast to other people who are less present um, what meditation has done for you? Absolutely. I, so I've been meditating for about 10 years and a little over 10 years. And I, you know, immediately one of the things that happens with meditation is you start relaxing. Like, it, it's amazing. I, I, you start relaxing in the first five minutes, you know. So, of course, as you practice, you get more and more relaxed. Um, you just start to incorporate the ability to relax more easily into your life, or I did, most people do, and it's brilliant. You know, I went from being really a stressed out, crazy person, a um, lot of anger internally, a lot of uh, issues of confidence, self-worth, all those things, um, and they were really overwhelming, and that was a big part of why I started meditating. I just thought something has to get better. And oh, so you were really looking for a solution. Yes, very much so. Very much. So. I felt really crazy internally. Not. I don't think anyone around me so much realized that, you know, except for people who knew me really well. Um, so it wasn't like I was a maniac or anything, but I was just, yeah, I was pretty unhappy. And so I wanted a solution and it started giving me returns immediately. And then, um, you know, I, one of your engineers asked a question about how do we, you know, capture that moment right before we're about to be stressed or right before we're about to be upset. And how do we, in that moment, calm down, relax, perhaps meditate or do whatever we need to do to not explode or not, you know, put a lot of energy into something that we don't really feel good about. Yeah, like being that was angry. Chris. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, that's a really good question. And that my own experience with that is it takes time. It takes practice. Because as we said before, we're lost in thought a lot. And we're not so much noticing the here and now. And it's in the here and now where we get to make that choice. It's in the here and now where we, we notice, oh, I'm that what that person said, I'm gonna I'm starting to be upset about. And I'm feeling my anger rise or I'm feeling stress rise. And it's in that moment right there where we get to start to choose. And so we have to practice being in the moment so that when those moments happen, we're here. Because if we're lost in thoughts at that crucial moment of getting to decide, then we miss it. And on also... Even if we miss it, if we can at least come back down, and a lot of people can do this even when they start meditating, they start realizing they're in the middle of stress, or they're in the middle of being upset, or they're in the middle of whatever you know is making them uncomfortable. That that's a trigger, like oh, I'm upset again. Okay, mm -hmm. so they can meditate at that point if they want with a really short practice, or maybe they're so overwhelmed that they can at least do it after. You know, they realize, whoa, I'm really stressed out. Okay, and then after the situation ends, 
now they can meditate. Like they're still at work. They just had a, a huge deadline shift on them. They dealt with the person who's, you know, talking to them about it, giving it to them and all the things they needed to do after that. Okay. Now they can take, you know, a minute or two and just calm down. And what that does is gets you back to creativity. You know, if we go into stress mode, we go into fight or flight, a whole bunch of uh, neurological and physiological things happen. One of the most important ones for those of us that do creative work is that when we go into fight or flight, we go into hind brain. It's reactive. It's not creative. So if we can do things even after stress, to calm us back down, to shift the, uh, the system into, okay, now it's time to relax. This is not stress time anymore. Then our brain will shift back to the front brain. We will go back into frontal cortex, creativity, higher math, <clears throat> language ability, all that kind of creative stuff. We can shift that pretty quickly, especially if we practice. Because as soon as we start practicing this, we start rewiring our brain and training ourselves. Okay, when I do this, when I focus on my breath or I do this other kind of really quick meditation activity, this is what I want. I want my body to shift to relaxation, homeostasis, higher thinking. Whoa, what's and homeostasis? Homeostasis is the natural state of your body. So it's just everything's in balance. My experience is that emotional upset and stress are big productivity killers. And it's a, it's almost like my business depends on me getting better at dealing with those things. And so that, that's one of the reasons that I'm really interested in meditation is that I want to be able to get better at recognizing the triggers that you were talking about and kind of deal with these times quicker so that I'm not, so I can become more productive. Um, mm -hmm. So just to give you an example, if someone says something that pisses me off or if I'm dealing with some business failure, it seems like I'm, I don't know, working through mud all of a sudden. Sometimes I can't shake it off for hours. Um, when I'm on the job, I just feel like I don't have time for emotions. Um, I just try to ignore the upset, but it usually ends up costing me more time because I make more mistakes and I can't think creatively, as you were saying. Yes. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to, to change, to learn new things, to create new patterns, new habits. And one of the things that meditation does is increases our neuroplasticity. So not only are we creating a new pathway for meditation, we're also encouraging the brain to be plastic, to be malleable, to be creative, to be able to create, you know, new wiring, essentially, so that we can do and learn new things. So this is a brilliant thing to do for exactly what you're talking about. You know, how do I how do I increase creativity in my life? So that's one thing. The other thing is that as we're able to relax and calm down and if we practice this first of all when we're not stressed that makes a big difference so create I, it's really important that we do that we practice first of all and that we practice when we're not stressed so that at those times that you're talking about when we are stressed and we start doing and we meditate it's easier because the the mind and the body knows it's it becomes its own trigger right it's like oh you want to do this mm -hmm. okay i know how to do this so then when we get in times of stress we can relax we can do we can essentially shift from you know freaked out stressed out emotionally nutsness <laughs> to okay i can breathe i can relax i can you know, whatever it is you might want to do. Some people like to relax their body. Some people just find focusing on the breath is helpful. People, other people do visual meditations or auditory meditations. Whatever they focus on, it essentially shifts the attention out of the sort of heightened emotional or mental stress mode back into, okay, I can deal with this. This is possible. I can be calm. I can be creative.
A lot of people say, well, you know, stress is good. And I agree, just like I think thinking is good, you know. The point is not to get rid of stress or get rid of emotions or get rid of thoughts. That's not what meditation, in my experience, does. What it does do is helps us interact with those things in a healthier way. We can make choices about them instead of being overwhelmed by them. And it's not that I don't get uh, um, emotional or think too much. It's just that when I realize I'm doing those things, I have little tools that I can use so that I can come out of them if I want, so that I can make choices about whether I want to keep them going at that level or not. So that's really the difference. But can you give us a few of the tools or can you describe them or how to get started? Yeah. So let's do one now, actually. They're, Uh-oh. They're, they're, <laughs> they're Should really I sit down? Sh- I'm standing up. Uh, no, no, it doesn't matter. Should I close my matter. eyes? Well, okay. hold on. <laughs> let me just tell you. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background as we do this. First of all, what I'm going to teach you when you do it for yourself, when you practice, you'll do it for about three breaths long. So a breath is an inhale and an exhale. That's one breath. Um So really short, right? Three breaths is like maybe 10 to 20 seconds. And it's not important whether you do it for three breaths or not really. It's just that that's an easy way to measure something without having to look at your clock or your watch or set a timer. If you're in an elevator, who cares? You just, okay, three breaths, I can do that. Um, And to answer your question about uh, what position doesn't matter, Um, wherever you're at is perfect. So if you're standing, great. If you're sitting, great. If you're lying down, if you're doing a headstand, cartwheels, doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) You do spend some time doing those things. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Right. Exactly. I'm just trying to go for like the ridiculous. So you get the, you get the feel. Um, so yeah, position, you know, whatever you're, wherever you are. And then, Whether your eyes are open or closed, as I'm guiding you through this, I'm going to suggest that uh, everyone who's listening who can closes their eyes. The reason for that is most of us are really visually stimulated. And when we're learning something, it's really good if we can shut out as much stimulation as possible so that you can focus on what we're doing. Um, and as you're practicing it in the beginning, I would suggest closing your eyes at least, you know, until you get good at it. And for some people that's like three or four times for some people, they close their eyes for a week. You know, it does it's, it's really, you'll feel into it. So as I'm guiding you through it right now, close your eyes if you're comfortable with that and close your eyes every time you do this until you get good at it and you'll know, and, you know, try it with your eyes open when you feel ready. And then once you can open your eyes doing this practice, then, you know, <laughs> you can do it anywhere, even while people are looking at you, because no one can tell mm. if your eyes are open, right? Secret okay. meditation. Exactly. So I actually do them while I'm talking to people. And then some people are like, Were what? you doing it while I was talking to you? <laughs> um, not consciously this time, actually. But I can. Like, I can do it now. <laughs> so while I'm talking to you now. This is the beauty of it, right? Is it's being present and being focused. And what better way to engage in life than to be right here, really paying attention to whatever I'm doing, like you, right? I'm talking to you. And to be really engaged with you is, it's beautiful. Like it's really, you asked earlier, like, did I notice that it changed me and my relationships with other people? And what I've noticed with my relationships with other people is that I'm much better at paying attention, much better at really en- being engaged with them and knowing. I mean, it's amazing how much you can tell about people, you know, when you're really engaged, like it's much easier to follow and all those kinds of things. Anyway, okay, I'll stop talking, but. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I want that. I'm ready. Yeah. Let's do this. Yeah. Okay. So, Let's everybody, if you're in a place where you can and you're comfortable, close your eyes. If you're not comfortable or not in a place where you can close your eyes, just look down at kind of preferably at the floor or something that's not a person because you want the thing to not stimulate, to not move if possible. So either closing your eyes or looking down at a place on the floor, a comfortable distance in front of you. First step in any meditation that I teach is to become present. So 
just as I'm talking to you with your eyes closed, just be aware of where you are, that you're sitting or standing wherever you're sitting or standing. So first step is just to become conscious or aware or notice where you are and that you're there. So that's presence right there. Step one, check. Okay, step two, we're going to do a really simple just noticing our breath. So bring your focus, bring your attention to your breath. However you're breathing right now is perfect. You don't need to change it. Just notice it. So staying aware that you're sitting or standing, wherever you're sitting or standing, bring your attention to your breath. Just noticing it. And as we're doing this, a couple things can happen. Sometimes when we're noticing our breath, our breath will change. Just noticing our breath, we start changing our breath. And that's fine. Just notice that you're changing it. Remembering that the whole point of this is to be present and to focus on something in the present. So your breath is happening right here and right now. And however it's happening is how it's happening right here and right now. So whatever's happening with your breath is perfect. Just notice it. And then the other thing that can happen is sometimes our breath is a bit subtle, like hard to notice, especially if we're in a busy place. So if it helps when you're doing this, anytime you're doing it, you can just put a hand on your chest to give you something to notice. You can notice your chest rising and falling as you breathe. Another thing you could do is gently constrict the back of your throat. Just tighten your throat a little bit so that you can hear your breath moving in and out. So again, you don't really have to do anything to notice your breath. But it, and if you want, if you're having difficulty, either putting a hand on your chest so that you give something to notice easily, your breath rising and falling, or constricting your throat a little bit so that you can hear your breath. So let's do the actual practice now, now that you understand all the elements of it. So for this practice, first step is always presence. First step is noticing that you're there, noticing where you are, noticing that you're here. And for this practice, bringing your attention to your breath. And let's count three breaths. And a breath again is an inhale and an exhale. That's one at your pace. An inhale and an exhale. That's two. And an inhale and an exhale. That's three. So do that now. Just being present, step one. Step two, count three breaths. So do that now, just noticing your breath for three breaths. And just to get really good at this, let's do it one more time. So when you're doing this on your own, this is how it'll work. You close your eyes in the beginning until you get really good at this. So you would close your eyes and step one, become present. Notice yourself where you are. Step two, notice three breaths. So let's do that one more time. Be present, count three breaths. Do that now.
Then at the end of your three breaths, you can just soften your eyelids and let your eyes open. And sometimes it's fun to just check in and see how much more relaxed am I now than I was when I started. That's a kind of nice thing to do. And you can feel a little grateful to yourself for doing whatever you did, your three breaths, to help yourself relax. You feel like it's, I don't know, helped you find more work or make more money or do your job better? Absolutely. It, uh, it, it gets my wheels turning. Um, like different opportunities that I didn't think of that I could actually go for. I do a lot of live sound for a bunch of the bands that play around here. I live just north of Atlanta. And so I host open mics and stuff like that. So I'm always kind of looking for something, like just some something I can do to add value to the local talent we have here. Well, I'm wondering if tomorrow I flipped a switch and all of a sudden Sound Design Live cost $5 per episode, do you think you'd still listen to it or do you think you'd just listen to something else instead? I, uh, I'll be honest with you. I would, uh, I would listen to it <laughs> because uh, I just dig it. I, 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 I just dig it, yeah. And th- there's not much like it. If it, was, if it was $5, yeah. Well, Drew, the good news is that Sound Design Live is free and will continue to be free. <laughs> And if you want to support it with $5 per episode, you can do that at patreon.com slash sounddesignlive. And that will help me to continue to improve the show to amplify its impact for you. Are you familiar with Patreon? I uh, Honestly, the only, uh, only I've seen it on your site. It's basically a way for creators like me to connect with their community. And it provides a flexible way for people like you to support the podcast. So they can contribute one, five, ten dollars per episode, and then you can set a cap on how much you want to spend per month. So if I actually publish a hundred episodes in a month, something crazy happens, you can still say, you know what? I don't actually want to pay a thousand dollars. I just want to pay ten dollars a month. You know? That's yeah, and that was that was exactly what I was about to ask. I was thinking, <laughs> so what, what if what if you what if you knock thirty out in thirty days? I've never supported anybody like that. I've done Kickstarter stuff. When, when I see something I like, but what do you think about the crowdfunding method? Do you think that's a good way for makers and artists that, to support the projects that they're doing, or do you think that's too much like begging or something? I uh, I, I dig it. Um, in fact, I, I did one this past year, but I didn't really go for my own hot project. Oh, you did one for like your own I'll, project. All right. Yes, but what it was, it was um, I was because I host so many open mics. And I wanted to, uh, you know, I've been big into Pro Tools for almost, God, 15 years. Because I, I was, I went to this audio school back in 2000, and that was processed. I got, I got into Pro Tools when they were in version five. So I've been doing the multi-track audio stuff, but most of it's just been myself. But what I wanted to start doing is, mo- I get a lot of singer-songwriters. Sometimes we get smaller groups, but I wanted to multi-track several of these guys for multiple reasons. Because some, some of them, I thought. If I could play the, if I could let them hear themselves back, they could. Um, some people are just amazing, but other people I think would benefit from it by hearing their flaws. And you know, I need to change this. I need to change that. And it's an easier way for me to. I know I've grown as a musician because I could play something, listen to it, critique it, and kind of and come back at it with you know from a different perspective or different angle. So I wanted to give that to these guys. So I did this crowdfunding thing, and I I did it for a thousand dollars, and I was successful. I. Um, I made it about the people instead of about myself. And I think that's probably the only reason I was able to be successful here. I don't think it's selfish at all. I think if people are legitimately going to put a project together and make it happen, then I'm all for it. Thank you. You're welcome. I feel feel different. Yeah. Nice to notice because it's good. It's encouraging, you know, when we see, especially in the beginning, when we see or feel, you know, or sense like, wow, okay, yeah, that helped. It's good. So it's good to notice that because it'll encourage us to do it. If we see the results, like you can feel, like it's palpable for me. Like I feel more relaxed now than when we did it. You know, my voice changed. It's like, oh, right. <laughs> I need to talk a little louder. 
So it's, you know, noticing those things can be kind of fun, like, oh, yeah, that helped. And it'll get, you will find, that's especially nice because you'll find over time, if you notice every time, you get more and more relaxed with the same practice, right? Because you're building that pathway in the mind. You're building that ability and that capacity. It's like building a muscle. It gets stronger and stronger. So you'll notice over time that you are able to relax deeper as you practice. And I recommend practicing three times a day. Do you have any habits of or techniques for how to remember this, like at a certain time or setting an alarm or once an hour or something like that? Mm-hmm. Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> it's very personal, I find. So generally what I do is I have my students think about, I call them uh, those I also call triggers. We've had triggers for a lot of things, but <laughs> um, meditation triggers. So things that happen in your life that you can associate with this. So... Um, you know, what happens daily in your life, preferably three times a day, that you can use to remind yourself to do this really short practice. Some people like to do like waking up at noon and then going to bed. Some people like to do it when they brush their teeth. Some people like to do it um, on the way to the bathroom. So going to the bathroom is a trigger or when they're um, washing their hands after the bathroom. So that can be, you know, every time you wash your hands, you do this because when you're in the bathroom washing your hands, you can close your eyes, no problem. And you've got three breaths washing your hands, easy. So you can do things like that. Other people, as you suggested, do things like set an alarm, um, top of the hour every hour, that ends up being more than three, which is great. You know, where they set an alarm for three times a day or whenever they sit down for meals. Yeah, that's what I was thinking (laughs) since you said three times a day, the first thing I thought of was meals. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it it becomes a bit like a prayer, which maybe some people will feel a little funny about, you know, sitting down before the meal, closing their eyes, but you can do it after, you know, or right in the middle, pause for a second. It's, it's pretty short. It's about three breaths. It's like 10 to 20 seconds. So even in the beginning, when you're closing your eyes, people generally, unless you're eating with someone, aren't going to notice like if there are people sitting around you. So you don't have to feel too self-conscious. And of course, when you get, when you feel comfortable with that practice and you can do it with your eyes open, then you're good. You can do it anywhere and you won't feel self-conscious. I remember my grandmother was often seemed like she had a lot of anxiety and I remember once I mentioned that to my dad and his response was yeah well try to figure out how to deal with that now so it's not so bad when you get to be that age <laughs> 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 I said okay it's, it's, that's a pretty good tip yeah yep yeah. um okay so at the beginning we talked about you mentioned many meditations so I wanted to connect that to your product called toothbrush meditations mm-hmm. which Um, is a collection of lessons, each one short enough that you can learn it while you're brushing your teeth. And I wanted to let you know that I tried the first one, which you have posted on your site, and it felt good. Can you maybe give us an example of how you or your clients use these in day-to-day life? Is it, are the, I guess the toothbrush meditations are pretty similar to what we just talked about, um, which are having triggers and uh, having times to to remember to practice, practice these, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So essentially you can, you can learn them while brushing your teeth and then you can still do them while brushing your teeth. Also, I think that's a great time to meditate because you don't, it, if you brush your teeth every day, um, which a lot of people do more than once. So you've got a built in, you know, reminder to meditate. And most of us brush our teeth, you know, where there's not a lot of stuff going on. So it's easier to remember. We're not distracted. It's a good, it's a good, I find that's a good trigger for meditation. So that's why I called them the toothbrush meditations because you can learn them while brushing your teeth and then you create that habit, right? Mm -hmm. So, so now you've got that association of, oh, I'm brushing my teeth. I'm going to do, you know, a 10, 20 second meditation. So they are, the toothbrush meditations are essentially what we just did. And then So that's a mini practice that we just did. So the toothbrush meditations are mini practices, mini in time, mini as in short in time. And then there's seven of them because 
we'll get bored, you know, we get, well, at least I do. <laughs> I get bored focusing on my breath. It's fun. And like, I learn different things about it. And I'm curious about, well, how am I breathing now? How am I breathing in this situation? What's my breath like there? And yet, you know, as a creative person, I want to do other things. So the toothbrush meditations are like, okay, here's a visual practice. So instead of focusing on the breath, we focus on stuff we can see. Or there's an auditory practice. So we don't focus on breath or something we're seeing. Instead, we focus on what we can hear. There's also kinesthetic practices so that we're focusing on like physical sensations because some people are really interested, you know, very like they really like to focus on and pay attention to their bodies. So, you know, dancers will like that. Maybe your sound engineers will really prefer the auditory one and <clears throat> visual artists like the visual ones. So, you know, some people lean towards one more than the other. Or if you're like me, I just like variety. So I came up with all these for myself initially. And then I started teaching them because I, I found that, wow, you know, some people like this one, some people like that one. So that's what they are. It's a series of different ones. So you'll, most people like one or two of them a lot and then either don't do the rest of them or play with all the rest of them. Can I measure my meditation practice somehow to see if I'm getting better? Yes, you can. Oh, this is fun, actually. It's, I have to, as a science major, I have to say this is not very scientific because um, it's an internal measure versus an external measure. Uh, however, I use it a lot when I'm learning something new, like a new practice or, or something that's designed to help me in some way, like mentally or physically or emotionally. And that is creates a rating system for yourself. So I like to use one to 10 or sometimes zero to 10, depending on what it is, but one to 10. So for instance, one is super relaxed, super chilled out. Like you're practically asleep. Like you're just totally putty. Right. <laughs> There's no tension, no stress, nothing. And then 10 is like, you are so stressed out, so overwhelmed, you can barely focus, you can barely remember how to rate yourself, right? Okay. So what I like to do is after a meditation, rate myself. How'd that work? How'd that go? Mm. And it can be really useful to rate yourself before and after. Because what happens is you start, well, you start to see, well, what's the difference, right? How much did I affect what, I, what I'm, you know, my situation? Because it's harder to, it can be harder to rate yourself, you know, over a few days. Like, how did I feel five days ago when I gave myself a rating? You know, maybe I don't remember so clearly. But I can, okay, how stressed am I right now? Like, I'm overwhelmed. I'm a bit freaked out. Maybe I'm an eight. I'm going to do this practice. Okay, and now how am I right now? You know, what's my number now? And you can start to see, like, what that does is helps you see how effective your practice is. And you can start to see how over time you get better and better at it. And, of course, also when you're in really stressful situations, you're probably going to have to do a couple mini practices to get down. And that's just a function of, wow, you were really that stressed out. <laughs> uh, so where are you on the scale right now right now yeah yeah i'm pretty I'm pretty relaxed i have to say probably a four i was gonna say four too but i thought maybe four wasn't good enough i thought maybe you're gonna be lower than me oh no four. Oh. well and, uh, we're meeting on a level level playing field then there we go and it's good to remember that this is your own your own um uh oh, scale right. like my four is not the same as your four well, I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. Like where we we are connected and interacting right now. So that's yeah, true. we should be we should be entrained on some level. But just to I, I think that's important to remember for yourself too. Like your four might change. You know, like maybe after you practice this a lot and get good at it, you might find that you your ten and your initial ten, which was kind of like okay, yeah, I get this ten stressed a lot, is not even on your chart anymore. You know what I mean? It's more like a 12 now because you don't go there anymore.
It's pretty obvious to me that I sleep worse on nights when I watch exciting movies or read anything sure. business related right before bed. Sure. But it's hard to stop because I like those things and I feel kind of this pressure to to fill every waking moment of my day with media and education and personal improvement. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a question about that. What do I do? <laughs> How do you... Great. Can I? I guess you already you already told me about toothbrush meditation, so that already helps. So I do that when yes. I brush my teeth. Um, yes, before but I, you go to bed. I don't know. Do you have anything else to say about sleep? What do you do personally, or what do you recommend to your clients? Yeah. Well, you know, I read a long time ago this thing that I just got reminded of recently, <laughs> which is exactly uh, pertaining to what you're talking about, which is that. One thing we can do is make our bedroom a place for sleeping and sex, but sleeping since we're talking about <laughs> sleep, right? <laughs> so, which, and by what I mean is like, we don't read in bed. We don't look at our phones. We don't bring in our iPods or iPads. Uh, we don't bring our laptops. So what you know, does that we do? Well, so what that does is starts, to, it's again an entrainment, right? It's a training ourselves. So when we walk in our bedroom, or if we're in the studio, when we go over to our bed, what we're telling ourselves is this is a place of relaxation. This is a place where I slow down, where everything starts to go into sleep mode, not stimulation mode, not learning mode, not, you know, exciting speed number 7,000 movie mode, right? It's like, it, it's, it becomes... I hate to say sacred because as a meditation, people are like, ah, but I think it, I mean, for me, sleep is sacred. You know, if I don't get enough sleep, I'm like a crazy person. <laughs> I have to meditate a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so creating that space for ourselves, I think is really important. And I think it, when, when I think about it like that, when I think about, okay, what am I telling myself? If when I get in bed in order to sleep, I stimulate my mind first, like that's kind of counterproductive because really what I want is for my system, my mind, my emotions, my energy, my body to relax and slow down. And instead what I'm doing is going, learn something. Isn't this fun? <laughs> Read this, right? There's one more minute in the day. <laughs> yeah. And so it's a little bit like just from that perspective, I think it can really help to take all our books out of our bedroom. If you have a TV in there, get it out. You know, don't bring your computers and all of our all of your devices in there. If you really want to do that stuff, then do it before you go to bed, not in your bed. Mm -hmm. You know, do it in your office or in your on your couch or you know, whatever your situation is so that you're not in your bed space. One thing I think that can help Nathan to break this habit is to give yourself time before you go to before you go into your bedroom to do those things. Oh, okay. You know? So like carve it into your day. Like if it's really that important, don't make it part of sleep. If you want good sleep, make sleep sleep and make education or entertainment, you know, okay, give yourself the the luxury of enjoying education and enjoying, you know, I'm from 10 until 11, I'm going to read or watch movies or whatever it is. And then at 11, I'm going to bed. The most common obstacle that I hear from my coaching clients to creating the amazing career in audio that they want is confidence. And, mm. and I'm just surprised that it comes up over and over again. Yeah. Um, in sessions that I have with people. So I usually start by talking to them about the difference between confidence and competence and then suggest mm. some kind of easy daily activity like the five minute journal. But could you talk about what you think are the most common reasons for feeling low self confidence and maybe suggest a couple more tools or strategies I could give my clients to start mm -hmm. helping with their self confidence? One of the things that happens is we lose confidence because we know we get overwhelmed. It's like what you were talking about before. You know that when you go into an emotionally or mentally stressful situation, it's hard. You're not as creative. You make more mistakes. Maybe you're going to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. 
you know, all those kinds of things. And I think that can really sap our confidence. I think this is one area that where we we lose confidence. We know that when we get into situations that are super stressful, we don't always deal with them well. And that that's hard. So this is one way where practicing presence and which helps us be in the moment, it helps us be engaged with what's happening in a better way. And it also helps us calm down so that we can go back into being creative. We can go back into higher mind and you know do the things as well as we're able to do. This is a really nice way to start dealing with that kind of, those kinds of confidence issues. You know, George Cow said something really brilliant to me once. He was like, well, there's the confidence of um, learning a skill and knowing that you know how to do it. There's that kind of confidence. And then there's the kind of confidence that comes from just going out and doing it. You know, and that, I, that was one of the best things anyone ever said to me about confidence is like, we can sit behind our books and our internet learning things and going to classes and perfecting our skills. And that can give us a certain kind of confidence. And yet, we really have to go out and do stuff and f- and like see what happens and see how we want to improve it and you know see what other people think about it and what they like and how they would improve it and get feedback you know for me really meditation honestly the reason that i teach it is because it has it is hands down, far and away, the most powerful thing I do for personal development. Absolutely. Wow, okay. It, yeah. I mean, I, nothing else even comes close. I mean, there are other things that help, of course, like the support of my friends and um, you know, people that are really wise that I have the privilege of talking to and things like that, of course. But what I do for myself meditation without doubt it is the power tool through meditation i can access all of my skills and all of the information around me Mm. better so i'm not being limited maybe otherwise certain amount of stress or um, certain lack of presence might limit my ability to understand the situation that i'm in what people are saying to me or even use my skills to their ability to you know their highest ability that's exactly it. First of all, you're great already. It's not, it's oh, not thanks, like, Elena. well, yeah, we all are. This is the thing, you know, it's like, it's not, it's not like you become someone else. It's just that you get more present with yourself. You get more comfortable with yourself. You, you, you stop being so lost in your thoughts that you're actually able to come down and appreciate what's happening. Secondly, it, it will, it just takes practice. You know, I mean, it's, I can say all these beautiful things. It didn't happen to me overnight and I'm still learning. I'm not present all the time by a long shot. You know, it's, it's just that when I'm, when I start to notice that something's going haywire, it's much, much easier for me now to calm down. about this but i'm curious about life in hong kong like what cultural differences have you struggled with and what suggestions do you have for anyone who might be thinking about spending some time there the biggest difference to me is that asians tend to be more subtle compared to americans especially Mm. american american culture is very direct and forthright and we really value things like laughter and being fun and loud. And um, if you go into Fashion America, things. yeah, and woo, you know, <laughs> if you're in an, a restaurant in America, it, it's generally pretty loud. You know, like we're we're just verbose and vivacious, and we're kind of like cheerleaders, you know, in like a nice way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have fun and we like that, and that's we're not very subtle. I think when we come to Asia, especially as Americans, it's good to do things like try and be a little quieter, like even just the the volume of your voice, like lower it a little bit, because what you'll start to notice is there's a lot going on at just a lower volume. And I mean a lower volume of sound, a lower volume of like the interactions are subtler. Mm-hmm. They'll tell you things that are just, they're not as direct. 
they're much more indirect. And it's not, it's not that they're trying to be confusing at all. Like culturally, they know exactly what they're telling each other because everyone knows. You know, we know that when I do this, I mean that. So I'm doing this to you and you don't get it because you're not from my culture. But that doesn't mean, you know, I'm trying to confuse you. I'm just doing the culturally appropriate thing to tell you, please, you know, don't do that. Mm. It's just that we don't realize it because it's not, you know, we didn't grow up with that cultural understanding. All right, Elena, thank you for giving me so much of your time. Um, You're welcome. If people want some more personal support with these issues or if they want to follow you online, where is the best place to follow you? And um, uh, do you want to talk about um, what kind of coaching you offer if people want to think about contacting you about that? Nathan, the best place to follow me or find me is on my website, elenamariafouché.com. I do Skype uh, sessions with people, like one-on-one -on -one sessions online. That's really fun and easy to do. I recommend people to do four in a row over about a month. You can find, basically emailing me is about that's really good from my site or just elena at elenamariafouché.com. And if people are interested in the toothbrush meditations, you can find that on my site by clicking on meditations or you can actually go straight to toothbrushmeditations.com. So that's toothbrush meditations with an S. Com. Sound design. Music in today's episode by Rui Faustino, Anna Caluza, and Antonio Borgini. You can find more of it by going to Rui Faustino.com. That's R U I F A U S T I N O.com. 